What's going on everybody? I'm Can't Kill Dill, lover of all things morbid, macabre, and horrific. If you feel like that describes you, maybe you should gut the like button and hang it from the goalpost in the football field. I'm not gonna hurt you. <laughs> Movies don't create psychos. Movies make psychos for creative. I'm just gonna bash your brains. I feel a little rosy, yeah. It was the summer of 1995 in the quiet northern California town of Woodsboro. Two local high school students, 16 and 17 year old Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker, would hatch a plan that would forever alter the course of their lives and the lives of many, many others. The murder of Maureen Prescott. Billy Loomis was popular amongst his classmates for his looks, his charm, cool attitude, and silver tongue. Stu Mocker, on the other hand, was a renowned class clown and one of the most well-liked students in attendance at Woodsboro High School, due in part to his hosting of parties. Both boys made good grades and both stayed relatively out of trouble. From an outside perspective, one would see these two unassuming youths as your average small-town American teenagers. However, something much darker lurked beneath the surface, something they kept hidden from everyone. It was this kindred darkness that drew them to one another as children, something in them broken before birth. It was this innate imbalance and lack of empathy that kept them close. Neither one discussed this with the other. They didn't need to. A month had passed since Nancy Loomis abruptly up and left her husband and son, leaving Billy without a proper explanation and a deep sense of abandonment. Billy likely began to act out, taking out his frustrations on those around him, but more specifically, on his best friend, Stu Mocker, who for all intents and purposes was Billy's personal punching bag, but also the one person that admired Billy the most. Stu had an undying loyalty to Billy. It could even be argued that Stu was possibly in love with him. Though one thing is certain, Stu had a fear of Billy. Stu being the more submissive and sensitive of the two and prone to peer pressure. Billy, being the more conniving of the two, was more dominant and aggressive. Billy likely took advantage of this relationship dynamic, often manipulating his friend into doing his bidding, even if just to see how far he could push the easily suggestible sidekick. This relationship was unhealthy for both boys' mental health. However, Stu presumably had a loving family, happy home life, and a budding high school romance with 16-year-old Casey Becker. There was a sense of reality, safety, and healthy relationships that could hold the unstable, but mistaken for hyperactive, Stu Mocker together. Billy likely had resentment festering towards his father, Hank. He would often fantasize about killing him, even considering working up the courage to propose the idea to Stu. Billy would have assumed it was some wrongdoing of his father's that caused his mother to leave town and abandon him. Though Hank Loomis wouldn't take the blame, he'd almost ignore the situation entirely, leaving Billy to cast a large amount of blame on himself. What if he was the reason his mom abandoned him? Was he really so unlovable? Besides, even if he could blame it on Hank, Billy knew he couldn't bring himself to kill his own father. Thoughts like these would drive Billy mad. Luckily, Billy had a stable relationship with his high school sweetheart, Sidney Prescott, and as long as they were together, things were okay. Her father, Neil, even seemed to like him, though Neil was away on business trips often. But her mother, Maureen, she seemed to act a little strange when Billy came around. At least Billy would likely pick up on some sort of body language or signs from her, as he was rather cunning and perceptive. He stayed on her good side. He had heard things about Maureen, talk of her having an affair. A few names had been tossed in that ring, but most prominently was 32-year-old Cotton Weary. Billy cast those small-town rumors aside as to not potentially upset Sidney, who seemed to turn the other cheek on such rumors. Mid-August, 1995, Billy was approached by a stranger, 26-year-old Roman Bridger. Roman told Billy he had the answer to why his mom left, and that he could prove it. At first, Billy was angry with the stranger, until his desperation got the best of him. Roman took Billy back to a local motel just outside of town. Roman didn't talk much about himself, didn't give away any personal details. As he put it, he had his reasons. He told Billy that he had been watching Maureen for weeks and that he had captured on film the answers Billy had been seeking. The reason his mom abandoned him, he found who was at fault. 
Roman showed him the footage he'd captured of Maureen Prescott and Hank, Billy's father, together in a motel, the very same motel where they sat in that moment. Roman could sense Billy's instability. He could see the fury boiling over. How many lives does she need to ruin, Roman would say. It was then that Roman planted the seed. The world would be better off without her. Billy agreed. Roman suggested the impossible, but to Billy, it was exactly the answer he'd been looking for. Billy took the bait. Roman gave him some tips on how to get away with the murder, suggesting he even take on a partner, someone to pin it on just in case they were caught. Billy knew Stu was the perfect accomplice, though he would keep the details of his father's affair to himself. Billy likely played it off as a half joke at first, testing the waters, but when he saw the look in Stu's eyes, it was the same look that stared back at him from every mirror. Stu didn't take a lot of convincing. There was something sick in him that was hungry, and Billy's plan sounded like the perfect opportunity to satiate that craving. Billy and Stu had spent weeks studying serial killers and how they preyed on their victims and what ultimately got them caught. On a cool mid-October night, Billy and Stu had broken into the Prescott house after Sydney had left for a movie with her best friend Tatum Riley. With Neil Prescott away on business, Maureen had a guest over. Cotton weary. Billy and Stu hid in the hallway closet for hours, the anticipation building in them, their hearts racing, sweat beating. They waited with clenched fists. Once Cotton left, they would hear Maureen get in the shower. The two of them made their way into the bedroom. Billy hid in the closet, Stu under the bed. Billy held the knife close to his chest. It would be him to get the first turn. This was the thrill he didn't know he needed until it was already happening. Once the shower stopped, they knew it was time. The anticipation and anxiety in their stomachs turned into a sort of arousal. Maureen entered the room, wrapped in her towel. Billy would be the first to emerge from his hiding spot, coming at Maureen with the knife. She would hold up her arms in an attempt to defend herself, only to receive deep wounds in her forearms. As she attempted to run, Stu would reach out from under the bed, grabbing her by the ankles, making her fall to the ground, where he would crawl on top of her. The two of them took turns with the hunting knife. She was stabbed repeatedly, suffering deep wounds in the stomach, chest, neck, face, and groin. Most of the wounds were likely received post-mortem. At this point, Billy realized this was more than revenge. Like Stu, he had a hunger in him, and for the first time, he had a taste of what he truly craved. It was then that Billy told Stu to leave, to calm himself down and go see Casey. Billy still had work to do. After Stu left, Billy stared in awe at what they had done. He felt relief, not guilt. He felt satisfaction, not shame. He grabbed Cotton Weary's brown leather coat that was left on the bed. He made sure to smear Maureen's blood on the coat before putting it on. It was at this time that Sydney had been dropped off by Tatum. Billy, hearing that familiar honk as Tatum drove away, he ran downstairs, trying to slip out the back door before Sydney could see him. He just barely made it. As luck would have it, Cotton and Billy had a very similar haircut and build. Sydney believed she saw Cotton Weary fleeing from her house. Feeling a strange sense of impending doom, Sydney ran upstairs to see if her mother was okay. But what waited for her was a gruesome scene, her mother displayed in the most grotesque fashion. The plan had worked out perfectly. After Billy fled the house, he dropped the bloody coat in Cotton's car, framing him. The better part of a year would pass, Billy and Stu had talked very little about what had happened, but as time went on, that familiar hunger grew, and this time they knew what their darkness was craving. They would attempt to recapture some of what they experienced by going to the local video store and renting piles of horror films to binge. But the films only left them yearning, but filled with ideas. Films like Halloween, Friday the 13th, Psycho, and When a Stranger Calls. They knew they were going to kill again, and after Casey Becker dumped Stu for 18-year-old Stephen Orth, they knew just where to start. But this time, it would be different. This time, they would truly respect and embrace their darkness, giving it both a face and a voice. October 1996. That was the beginning of the Woodsboro Massacre. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. Um, 
this is something a little different. I've never really done this before. Um, none of this is actually fact or anything or exactly how it happened. This is just like those in-between details that we've never been made fully aware of. And so this is just kind of my interpretation of it. Take it for what it is. Uh, you don't have to like it, you don't have to agree with it. But if you guys enjoyed it and want to see more stuff like this, let me know. If you enjoyed the content, go ahead and stab the like button slash subscribe and gut that bell notification. See ya.